Hello, everyone. Thank you all for coming, and welcome to AI Infra at scale. What a year it's been, right? AI dominates the headlines across the tech industry, with bigger, better models, new AI-powered applications, and for those of you here, lots and lots and lots of GPUs. But before we dive into where we are today, I'd love for us to zoom out and talk about how we got here so we can put this moment into perspective. And a, a lot of this history is probably familiar to you all, but please bear with me because we cannot do justice to the history of AI without going all the, back, all the way back to the 1950s when Alan Turing famously asked the question of whether a machine could think. And there was an initial period of enthusiasm at that time that was followed by a long AI winter. But things pick up again in the late 90s, and many people attribute the thawing of the AI winter to Deep Blue. For those of you who remember this, Deep Blue in 1997 from IBM beat world champion Gary Kasparov in a chess match. And Deep Blue was powered by almost 500 custom chips, and it could process about 200 million chess moves on a per-second basis. And for a minute there, people thought that Deep Blue was the future. But in reality, it would turn out to be a high watermark for this kind of hand-coded computer intelligence. What followed next were neural networks. What's now known as a convolutional neural network, or a CNN, was first introduced by Jan LeCun back in the 1980s, and it's gone through several evolutions. In 1998, Lynette 5, a CNN was able to correctly recognize handwritten zip codes from over 60,000 post office samples with over 99% accuracy. But CNNs were notoriously hard to train. And so people for a while favored recurrent neural nets because you could train them sequentially, but this would change in 2012 because AlexNet comes along in what's sometimes called AI's Big Bang moment. And AlexNet was a much bigger CNN than Lynet 5. It was trained on one of the largest image data sets at the time, ImageNet, with over 14 million images, and it was trained on all of two GPUs. AlexNet resulted in the step change improvement in labeling images, and it created all kinds of breakthroughs with image recognition. But what was perhaps a more important breakthrough was that AlexNet demonstrated that it was possible to parallelize training in a CNN. Five years later, Google releases the paper, Attention is all you need, introducing the concept of a transformer model. And this leads to all kinds of large language model innovation, BERT by Google, followed by the Generative Pre-trained Transformer, or GPT. In 2021, diffusion models break on the scene with DALI introducing amazing text-to-image generation. In November 22, all of these model breakthroughs reach public consciousness when OpenAI launches its chat interface, ChatGPT. In 23, we add Meta, make Llama 2 openly available for research and commercial use. We follow that up with Llama 3, both a 70 billion model and an 8 billion model in April, and just last week, we launched a 405 billion parameter model, Llama 3.1, the first frontier level open source AI model. And this triggers an avalanche of innovation across the industry with an entire ecosystem being built up around Llama. And so it's interesting to look at that whole decade between AlexNet and GPT and contrast that to the speed and the intensity of innovation that's happening now. So many of you across the industry have worked together to contribute to a deeper understanding of AI that we have now. But since this is an AI infra at scale event, I want to talk about how all of this model innovation connects to infrastructure. There's always been a symbiotic relationship between the evolution of AI research and the evolution of infrastructure. The availability of compute, distributed systems, large-scale data processing have all contributed to all of the innovation we see in AI today. And similarly, the AI roadmap has helped shape the infrastructure roadmap. So I'm now not going to walk you through the whole history of data center computing, but really simplistically, for decades, data centers were dominated by a CPU x86-based architecture. But it turns out GPUs are way better 
and floating point arithmetic, which is at the center of how models learn. And so here you can see, as of 2012, the volume of data center GPUs is pretty negligible. You start hearing about large research clusters. In 2017, we at Meta create our first research supercomputer. And you start seeing data center GPUs kind of get a little bit more. This is the graph after ChatGPT is released in 2022. And by 2023, it is clear there is an explosion of GPUs. The shift is fundamental, which is why you'll hear today's computer is not a PC. Today's computer is a data center. And now you're hearing GPU clusters in the tens and thousands for just a single training job to be run, and fleets in the hundreds of thousands. In our own fleet here at Meta, we'll have 600,000 GPU units by the end of the year. And by the way, this is in addition to all of the CPUs infrastructure that we already have so we can run multiple parallel workloads. So that brings us to today. Our ambition as an industry and a society have grown since those early days of Deep Blue and AlexNet. Today, we talk about generalized intelligence, where machines can perform tasks, even complex ones, on par to humans, maybe better than humans. And irrespective of where you are on the spectrum of you know, extreme skepticism to hopeful optimism, there is no question that there is still a lot to learn, and we're still early on this journey. So let's talk about some of the challenges we face as we continue to scale these models towards those big, lofty goals. Today's models have been improving predictably based on three inputs. One is data, the second is compute, and the third is algorithms. So number one, data. The data required to train these models is enormous. With each model training generation, we keep adding more data. We're talking trillions of tokens. Just for an example, LAMA 3.1 was trained on over 15 trillion tokens. And on the infrastructure side, we've made a lot of advances in how we load and prepare data for training, but also in how we, we extract signal from data, quality signal. And we're continuing to evolve our data pipelines and our data warehouses to be able to scale with AI. But there is a bigger, deeper challenge here. There is a growing recognition that data might end up being the bottleneck even in the short term, in the next few years. And there's various predictions about it, about when we'll reach full usage of high-quality human-generated data completely. Let's think about that for a second. There is a point in time, somewhere in the near future, when we would have exhausted all available human-generated data for AI training. And that's unfathomable. So what are we going to do about it as a community and as an industry? Well, we have to work on getting major efficiencies in the data itself and data processing and just like the quality of data. But there are also efforts across the industry in being able to produce synthetic data, where we have models producing their own data and then models evaluating themselves and so on and so forth. And this is really, really exciting work. This brings us to the second primary input, and that is compute. And this one is close to all of our hearts here at, at scale. Conservative estimates put the growth of training at about four times a year for large models across the industry. And assuming that scaling continues here, there are a bunch of infrastructure challenges that we're still working to solve. The first is obviously just buying or producing massive amounts of GPUs. These chips are pretty expensive, by the way. And there's very few people manufacturing them. And about a year ago, I don't know if you all remember, there was a pretty big supply chain crisis that was hitting us all across the industry, and everyone was hunting for GPUs. And we used to joke, trying to buy a GPU during the supply chain crisis is like trying to buy toilet paper at the height of the pandemic. So what are we doing to mitigate this risk? We at Meta, like several other companies, are building our own custom silicon. A huge advantage to building our own silicon is that we can optimize the silicon for our own workloads. And that way, we get a huge advantage both in cost and in performance. Beyond that, a huge bottleneck to having these large clusters is just the sheer energy consumption. It's no secret that GPUs are incredibly power inefficient. Each GPU uses somewhere between half a kilowatt or a kilowatt of power. But guess what? 
the human brain, all of the human brain, uses about 25 watts. So we're off by a huge factor here, and unless we, we build on some real innovation here with energy, energy will become a real bottleneck in our ability to scale. And then you have scaling challenges during training. As you know, GPUs must be interconnected and computing in parallel during training. And unfortunately, if a single GPU fails, the entire training job stops because the model is no longer in consistent state. And so today, every time there's a failure, we fix the problem, restart training, and there you go again and again. And stopping and restarting is pretty painful, but it's made worse by the fact that as the number of GPUs increases, so too does the likelihood of a failure. And at some point, the volume of failures could become so overwhelming that we lose too much time mitigating these failures, and you barely finish a training run. So what are we doing about this? This is a huge area of focus and investment across the industry, and we're working on everything from trying to reduce the time that it takes to detect a failure to quicker restarts to all the way to new research paradigms around asynchronous training and other research ideas that no one's tried before. And so this is going to be an exciting area to keep an eye on. But beyond what I just mentioned, there are a ton more challenges we're working towards. Networking needs completely to be revamped because we're dealing with large-scale networking with GPUs interconnected and communicating with each other that the protocols don't scale anymore. There's the fact that all these interconnected GPUs are so hot that existing data center cooling techniques don't work. So we're reinventing new kinds of cooling technologies for data centers and keeping GPUs cooler. So the list of awesome engineering challenges we have goes on and on. We talked a bit about data and compute. Let's talk a little bit about the model algorithms themselves. And research here is evolving pretty quickly. And on the infra side, our job is to make sure that we bring these research breakthroughs into production and into the community as quickly as we can. And the algorithms themselves, there are maybe a few schools of thought that we should touch upon about what will lead to generalized intelligence. First is the scale is everything camp. You can see that in language models particularly, when well-trained, a model size is still the biggest predictor of performance. It's a hot point of debate right now, though, on whether these models, which are getting better and better at sort of next token prediction, will be able to make leaps towards better understanding, reasoning, being able to um, look at um, ideas and like draw conclusions, whether they'll be able to apply reason and causality and all the things that are common to human intelligence. So a second school of thought says that models need a more grounded understanding of the world, an understanding that comes from explorations, experiments, interactions, similar to how a child interacts with the world. Thus, there is an hypothesis that we need world models that can be used to run forward simulations with increased planning and increased accuracy. And this belief has driven some of our own research work in our research labs here, where teams are working on something called Joint Embedding Predictive Architectures, or JEPA. And so much of how machines learn is so much less efficient than how humans learn. Machines can grok new information, but it takes billions of parameters and exposure to tons of similar information Whereas humans can learn something, immediately derive some insights, and then use that to make decisions. So there is a third hypothesis that argues that we should look at the human brain for clues on new model architectures. And within all of this debate, there is the question of when you're probably asking too, which is how soon? How soon will we get to generalized intelligence? And so I'm going to make a prediction about this. No, I'm just kidding. I'm not going to take a position about whether this is going to take two years or 20 years. But here's what I do know and believe. At the moment, given the sheer size and scale necessary to support this kind of innovation of foundation models, there are very few entities in the world that are able to do this. And so we're seeing two different approaches emerge, a closed approach and an open approach. And we've been pretty public here at Meta about the fact that we're taking an open approach here. Generally speaking, an open approach distributes innovation and serves as a countervailing force 
to a concentration of power within a few entities or even one entity. And I, I think that's pretty cool. And in terms of the models themselves, we've set out to build models that are competitive with the best proprietary models. I directionally expect that we will continue to be able to open source these models as long as we, get, we are able to. But we also have a long history of open sourcing our underlying infrastructure. Whether it's the Open Compute Project, where we open sourced our data center designs, or React, which is used for building user interfaces, or closer to home, PyTorch, the most dominant machine learning developer library out there. And so we will keep building on all of this as a community. This is such a great time for us as technologists. The next several years are going to change the way that we work, the way we go about our lives. And as we saw earlier, there is no one company or research group that has been responsible for all of the innovation we've seen so far. Progress is moving fast right now, in part because we are all coming together and building on top of each other's discoveries. A paper gets published, libraries get released, a new open source model gets announced, and that is the spirit of At Scale. I really hope that you'll all learn something today and also share your thoughts and ideas, but even more than that, I hope that you'll leave feeling inspired to tackle some of these challenges ahead of us so we can all push on the next frontier of AI together as one community. Thank you all for coming. Hope you have a great day.